Hey everyone, welcome to UC Max Grand Rounds. My name is Britt Guest. And I'm Scott Kobner. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Britt? I'm good. I'm super excited about the show. We have a lot of really awesome faculty with us. But before we jump into it, headlines, bottom lines, what's coming up in MRAP world? Yeah, we got a lot of really exciting stuff coming up. For those of you joining us from the UC world, we have a huge show coming on on April 14th. We're going to be at the UCA conference in the one, the only, Las Vegas, but we're not oh, just okay. we're not just going to keep the fun there. It's not just going to stay in Vegas, all right? It's going to spill out everywhere. The uh, conference is from the 13th to the 17th. We'll be there on the 14th for some great education, but you can find us hanging out in the exhibition hall all throughout that time. Love it's it. It's going to be good. I don't know it's Vegas. That's the only part I don't love, to be honest, <laughs> but everybody loves to have a conference in Vegas, so it's going to be a good time. We'll be there. Okay, so our faculty tonight, we have got Josh Russell, we've got Paul, we've got Sean Nort. We have an awesome lineup for you, and of course, we also have Gita and Mike. Gita and Mike will be joining us on the show as well as being in the chat. So please ask all your questions. Our UC experts are in there, able to answer them live. Don't be a stranger. You can slide into our MDs in the chat. Huh? <laughs> slide into our DMs, you know, a little bit, nothing. All right, I thought it was good, Brent. I thought that it was good. That fell flat for me, that fell flat for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so moving on to the show. Scott, our next segment is going to be this clinical be images. Clinical images. Let's check it out. Roll the bumper. <laughs> Here we go. Clinical so this images. first image Woo! to me. <laughs> that was good. I liked it. So this first image to me is really <laughs> defined by the distribution. And when we think of rashes, obviously we're thinking life-threatening rashes, can't miss types of rashes, but we're also thinking that we wanna make a diagnosis if we can get a patient feeling better, of course, right? So this rash is vesicular and it's in a dermatomal distribution. And though we can't see exactly the next part, but the fact that it doesn't cross the midline, and I think we would see that if we traced ourselves around the back and the flank, we'd see that it doesn't cross the midline on the back either, is a big giveaway towards zoster. And I will tell you, in a self-deprecating way, I have been fooled by this rash in the past. And we talked about that. During our UC Max recording, that if you don't look, You'll be fooled. And I have to say for myself, teaching this all the time, always look, always look. And there's so a few times I didn't look. And it turns out later in the workup, after I've already done some further testing, I finally make that diagnosis of zoster. Gita, I think I remember on the recording, this might have happened to you also. Oh, yeah. It happened. I told the story about my mother-in-law who was like, will you look at this rash? And I was like, oh, yeah. I don't know. She thought it was poison ivy. I was like, sure, sure, it's poison ivy. And then it turned out to be jingles because you know I, I didn't look at the whole thing and then I felt like a big dummy uh, but you know this rash interestingly I, I think you're right the location really does it because if you were to look at like just a zoomed in portion of it you could almost convince yourself that it was like eczematous or something else like that but when you see the dermatomal distribution and realize wait no some of this is vesicular and hopefully along maybe they would give you a history that it might have been burning or um, a little more painful than you would expect eczema to be, then I totally agree with you. I would diagnose this as uh, herpes zoster or shingles. And so, the, of course, the next step, and I'll tell you one reason I love this, because it's pathognomonic. There's really nothing else that can cause this exact rash. So when I walk in the room, I make this diagnosis, and then I know exactly what I'm going to do for that. And if we still are having new vesicles forming, I'm going to think of an antiviral and then steroid medication also, which doesn't decrease the risk of post-herpetic neuralgia, but it does decrease the duration of symptoms. I love this rash. And I think there's some more rashes we have coming up also. Is that right, Kita? I think we've got more on the way. So normally we like to give you guys the case before, but you guys have grown so tired of that. So we change it up on you. We're just jump right into the answer for you this time. Uh, so that was a shingles rash or herpes zoster. You know, Mike, you'd have a lot of great wisdom on how you should treat the patient to get resolution of the rash and their answer there. But you know, the, the neuropathic pain component is also so important and it could be a really, not only a huge crisis for patients to deal with after you've discharged them and provided them with like a so-called curative therapy, but they're gonna deal with it probably so much that they might even come back. So think about prescribing something that's really good for neuropathic pain in addition to any other pain medications you might wanna offer them. Um, I normally reach to something like gabapentin, but whatever's available in your center and pharmacies near you is also a great addition to care. Let's 
jump into our second case. Uh, so we've got somebody who, he's like 14 years old, is coming in with this rash on both arms. It looks pretty awful when you get up nice and close to it. You can see that image in there. Let's see what Mike and Gita, sorry, Mike and Gita have to say about this one. Uh, we're going to actually give you the case this time first. Gosh, this is a really uncomfortable looking rash. Um, and I think I would ask a lot of questions like, is this rash all over the body? Is this patient look uncomfortable? Do they look sick? And if it's really just, you know, we're looking at these um, surfaces of the skin, when you really zoom in, you can see like, like henified areas, you're sort of distracted by the areas of, that are open and raw, uh, which I think in this case are really just excoriations. Um, and my presumption is this is a very, very itchy rash. Um, it looks like this person has like scratched off a lot of it. Looking in between at the tissue that you can identify, it really does look like an eczematous rash with some chronic changes of inflammation and like henification. That's where the skin starts to look kind of hard and leathery. Like this has been a longstanding process that looks like maybe more recently aggravated, which is, you know, what has prompted all the, um, the scratching uh, and the rawness of it. And so I, my first inclination would be to call this um, eczema, but bad eczema. Mike, what do you think? Well, I think we said something really smart, which was the duration of these symptoms. And most of the time when we look at rashes, it's going to be physical exam based. But one thing that is super important when you're thinking of something like eczema is the history. And you don't think like a 70 year old person who just happened to wash their hands twice in one day, all of a sudden has developed eczema. This is a lifelong process for a lot of people. And especially with this severity of eczema, almost as surely the patient has had that in the past and probably seen primary care, probably seen dermatology also. So with the prolonged duration of rash, without any recent exposures, then eczema is a very likely etiology of this. One of the really important things to consider is the fact that when you have eczema, some people feel that like it's an infection or somehow their hands are dirty and they'll do the exact opposite thing that they should be doing. Instead of decreasing hand washing, decreasing showering, they will increase their hand washing. They'll make sure everything is super clean and it really makes things worse. So I'll tell people maybe for this specific or similar type of rashes, you know, when you're in the shower, maybe three times a week is adequate. and just not to be indelicate, but washing the dirty areas and not washing the other areas that aren't really something that's getting dirty. And over this area, super important to make sure those moisturizers that you're putting on that, are your, yeah, you're doing that and that that's something that's going to be on there for a while and not get recently washed off. So yeah, it seems like this is what the diagnosis is. The thing about eczema is depending if it just comes out or if it's really severe or like you're saying, it has been there for a while and you get some of that skin thickening, it can present pretty differently. But that's what I'd be diagnosing in the urgent care. I would be starting not only therapy, but also talking about lifestyle modifications. This patient would be going home for outpatient follow-up and then returning if things get worse. Yeah. I think that this person, I would probably prescribe um, a topical steroid. Um, and probably reach for a sort of a mid-potency thing. Um, but also, when something looks quite this bad, I would want to reassure myself that we were not looking at something with a super infection, um, something like a secondarily infected eczema or a um, herpetic infection. So if the patient said like that they had a lot of pain on top of, of the pruritus, um, or if they had purulent drainage coming from some of these sores, that would definitely get my attention. But it sounds like in this case, that's not what we're looking at. So I totally agree that's what we would be doing. I mean, all those red flag symptoms we just sort of asked, I mean, why are we asking review of systems, right? Things like fever, unexplained weight loss, lack of a prior history, lack of response to therapy, associated pain or severe pain. I mean, all those things with added data are going to make me more concerned, just like you're saying. Super, super impressive rash, right? The entirety of like the, the extensor surfaces there being involved. And, you know, we use some fancy derm terms there. One of my favorite, uh, because it's an eponym that I also share, which is totally unrelated, cobnerization, um, really important. Uh, along lines of trauma, 
having a inflama inflammatory dermatologic condition to extend along those lines. So people who are just itching and scratching, excoriating themselves can present with really, really profound and impressive manifestations of other autoimmune dermatologic disorders. Psoriasis is a classic example. It's also kind of where that terminology when we hear lichenification coming from, um, seen a lot of times used to describe psoriasis. We put a poll out in the chat, say, which of you guys would prescribe antibiotics to this? I'm so proud of the audience. Uh, the majority of people, I think it was like 70, 71% said they would not. Uh, these things could be super impressive at times and um, could really kind of make you concerned enough that you might want to prescribe some antibiotics, but unless they truly have signs of infection, it looks frankly cellulitic, it's purulent, better to give those steroids. And remember, kind of I think about a head, shoulders, knees, and groin for a steroid application for potency. It doesn't really correlate with the childhood song, but that's how I remember it, using uh, really low potency steroids in those sensitive skin areas, the face and groin, and you can use moderate, even high potency steroids in a case like this, uh, where somebody's gonna really need some time to clear that up. All right, so that was eczema. Let's move on to the final case. So you have a young child coming in, parents super concerned that they're dying of some horrible blistering disease that's appearing around their mouth. Uh, they don't know what to do. They come to your urgent care. Let's see what Mike and Gita have to say about it. All right, here we've got a little kid and we've got some honey crusting kind of things. And uh, some of it looks like a little raw, but you know, if the patient said to me, uh, you know, if, if it didn't really seem to hurt, if they weren't really otherwise systemically ill, um, I would look at this and say that this looks a lot like impetigo. And uh, Chris Merritt and I did a segment on impetigo for EC Max not too long ago. And um, we discussed the fact that there are different types of impetigo. This looks mostly like non-bullous impetigo. There was one tiny little area that looks like it has a little fluid in it. Um, and perhaps there's a little crossover between bolus and non bolus here. Uh, but there's non bolus, which is the classic honey crusting. Somehow it always seems to be a board's review question with a, a kid and like the upper lip has some honey crusting on it. Um, that sort of classic, classic impetigo. There's a bolus form where you can get these, you know, bolle filled with fluid. Um, also typically painless, doesn't have to be on the, none of the impetigo stuff has to be on the face. And then finally, there's a version called ecthyma, which is um, a, a rarer uh, form and also a lot uglier that looks like these punched out ulcers. Um, and so in this particular case, again, classic impetigo, the child is probably well otherwise. Um, this is something that I would just be treating with some topical mupirocin and then seeing how they do. What do you think, Mike? I love that. And the fact is, we're always thinking about anything we do, like therapy with risk of harm, right? So we know that antibiotics don't have a huge risk of harm, but no one wants to give their kid a oral antibiotic if they don't need it. And something like mupirocin, putting that on topically should be equivalent therapeutically to an oral antibiotic, but really without all those potential GI side effects that you can get. So yeah, the honey crusted part that you talked about was really key thinking about, you know, what else could this be that would be more serious? And, you know, I'm not really seeing it, especially in a well-appearing child without any red flag symptoms. To me, this looks exactly like you're saying, Gita, looks like impetigo, looks like we can treat it adequately in urgent care, give some, you know, instructions for a follow-up if things aren't getting better or anything else develops because it's early in the course, obviously they can come back or proceed to primary care or the emergency department. But yeah, this is one of my favorite cases in urgent care because it's a pretty well-defined diagnosis with a pretty well-defined management strategy and something that we can really expect the patient will get better from. Impetigo can be super impressive, even if it's just localized to the mouth. One thing that comes up not infrequently and you might see in your next urgent care shift, it's actually a case of disseminated impetigo. You know, you've got a young kid, they're scratching their face, it's uncomfortable, they're scratching their arms and legs. And the next thing you know, you've got this like, bullous eruption all over their whole body. Like, invariably, uh, these kids end up getting seen by some peds infectious disease specialist because we get so concerned. It's like, oh, this looks horrible. Just know for those disseminated cases, it's no more life-threatening, no, no more serious, but you really need to do a systemic antibiotics at that point. Um, you know, depending on the degree of dissemination, it just resolves it much quicker. Uh, and it's something that you can reach to and feel confident that's the right choice in those cases. Before we move on to our next segment, we have a little bit of a fun trivia contest for some, I think it's free, free AirPods that we've decided on that we're doing. All right, so if you're the first person in the chat to get this right, we're gonna reveal the answer at the end of the show. So here is your fun trivia question for the month of February. 
So this is a type of cardiac disorder that someone might experience in February, maybe on Valentine's Day or the day after, if they get a little broken hearted. What is the disorder that we're thinking of? I'll let you ponder that as we transition to our next segment. What's next? That's right. What now? <laughs> All right, so I personally love this segment because I feel like there's so many times clinically where you have a patient and you do the initial things for their pain or whatever it might be and then they're still coming back like, it didn't work, what do I do next, what do I do next? So today we are gonna talk about acute on chronic back pain. I mean, how many times a shift do you see somebody with back pain? And I really want to go through, Sean, with you on how you kind of stepwise approach these patients with acute on chronic back pain, because they've usually tried all the first line, mm -hmm. maybe even some of the second line things, and what do we do next with those patients? And just to clarify, this is, there's no red flags. Mm -hmm. There's no history of IV drug use. There's no fever. There's no trauma. There's no incontinence. It's just good old back pain. So when you see a person coming in with acute on chronic back pain, what's your first line approach? So as we've established, we are not worried about red flags. So we're really looking at symptomatic relief and everybody out there has seen these patients. So yeah. I'll ask them and I want to get them out of the red back in black <laughs> comfort. That's what I'm looking for to do with them. So I ask, what have you done? And so very often they'll say, doc, I've done uh, ibuprofen, I've done a leave, and I've done acetaminophen and nothing's working. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, let's take a step back. What exactly have you been doing? Because I find that people use acetaminophen and ibuprofen too little, too frequently. And remember for an adult, the doses, and we have to correct that up there, it's a thousand milligrams. A hundred would be way too low. <laughs> that less. is too Make low. Make sure they take a thousand. <laughs> and maybe they were doing that at home. But it's 15 milligrams per kilo for the average person. So I say 1,000 milligrams every eight hours as needed, mm -hmm. alternating with ibuprofen, 600. And I usually say 600. Now I know a bunch of people say, don't, don't go over 400 and never go over 600. Right. I do not abandon ibuprofen until if I say try 600. If 600 doesn't work, I say try 800. Remember, there is all different patient variabilities. There's pharmacogenomics. So don't abandon a very good drug and probably the best drug or best drug class until you do that. Now, if they say, hey, doc, I've already done that, I say, right. all right, let's move on. Well, before we move on, though, what about another option of like a topical NSAID? So I think that that's great. And we are based here in Southern California. So in this country, in the United States, I think we're a little bit late to the game compared mm. to the rest of the world with topical non-steroidals. Now we really only have the one diclofenac uh, over the counter, mm -hmm. but it's very effective in other parts of the world. So I will welcome everybody from around the world who's watching, but you have ibuprofen and other ones, mm -hmm. but these are very effective. Uh, you apply the diclofenac to the area mm -hmm. and you do it every 12 hours and it's supposed to not be used for more than seven days. It works very quickly, but that patient that you're worried about, peptic ulcer disease, oh, they have kidney problems. Yes. You don't really have to worry because there's not systemic absorption. So that's exactly the next drug I go to. I say, use that, right. and if it doesn't continually work for the 12 hours, then you supplement with the earlier medications. And I love that because we know NSAIDs work so well, but we do frequently run into those patients that, oh, their kidney function isn't great, or that history of peptic ulcer mm -hmm. disease, they just can't tolerate it, and we really wish we could give this medicine to them, this is one way we can do it. Okay, so you have a patient who's asking you, but what about that injection? What about like a shot must be better, right? So we're talking, you want to just give them Motrin, maybe you give them 600, and they're like, no doc, I really, I want that shot, that one that's an IM injection. And I think even in our heads that, well, a shot must be better, right? An injection must be superior. Is there any benefit to the PO Motrin versus the IM Toradol? There really is, Britt, no difference between the two. Okay. And so would I never use it? Of course not. If someone's miserable in pain and I, they're gonna be there for a while, mm. I might even establish an IV. But m 
the vast majority of people don't need an intramuscular injection. And this problem, and I always say, you could put these people on an island without any medications or any botanics or anything, and they just have to sit there. <laughs> Within two to three weeks, they're going to get better no matter what we do. So we're really looking at symptomatic relief, and we do not want to raise this up and medicalize this mm -hmm. into really a bigger problem where they think every time they have this exacerbation, because we are talking about this can be acute or the acute on chronic, mm -hmm. right, the person who gets this exacerbation. So really try to refrain from using intramuscular or even intravenous except in those very rare cases because there really is not any benefit in yeah. the vast majority of these cases. And that shot hurts. My understanding is that a shot of Toradol is a pretty painful injection. So it doesn't come without some risks and some pain. And from every study, we're going to show a couple here. They're all older studies. They really show that the ibuprofen versus the IM Toradol, there's no benefit to the shot. Absolutely. Just go ahead and give the pills. Yeah, and a shout out to our uh, friends and colleagues at Rebel EM for lending us this. Thank you. But you can see that, I mean, these studies are older, but there really is no no difference. So please don't do it. If you do use Ketorolac, again, I won't get on a soapbox, but really 10 or 15 milligrams, do not give 30. And absolutely, please do not give 60 milligrams right. as an intramuscular injection. And you'll see in these older studies, they were giving injections up to 60. That's insane. If you really hate the kidneys, then okay, go ahead, but don't don't in practice. We never need to give 60. All right. So you have done your oral medications. You've done your topical medications. And the patient said, yeah, 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 doc. I took it just the way you told me to. I'm still having pain. What's next? So lidocaine patches are an excellent and very safe uh, alternative or adjunctive really because mm -hmm. we're going kind of stepwise and this is exactly what I do when I have these patients. So the nice thing about lidocaine 4% it is over the counter generally that'll be less expensive and it's as efficacious as the 5% for reasons if you need to or you know have to uh, uh, prescribe a prescription 5% but you can feel very comfortable in using the lidocaine 4% awesome and then you just apply it often people will apply it to the area right because it does work somewhat locally but it does have some systemic effects the recommendation is no more than three patches at once and no more than 12 hours then they get removed these are very safe but we do get concerned with more patches and prolonged use for maybe some increased side effects from the lidocaine. I kind of have this bizarre image of somebody who's in just so much pain and like covers themselves in mm -hmm. lidocaine patches. Don't do that. There, the, there could be some toxicity there. So there three could. patches. <laughs> okay, so again, you've done those things, you've done the lidocaine patch, but I mean, the lidocaine patch is gonna take a little bit of time to work. Yeah. What can we do in the urgent care that's another option to help give this patient some pain relief? So. I often start out like, what have you done? And then I say, what can we do now? And I say that to them, let's see what we can do now. This is something absolutely we can do now called a trigger point injection. Our own Dr. Jess Mason. So if you're a UC Max, UC Max subscriber or MRAP subscriber, you have this HD video, it's there. Open up your phone if you're not comfortable doing this. It is super easy to do. There's a couple of patients you don't want to do it in. If they have overlying infection, if they're on anticoagulation, sure. we have it laid out in Corpendium, we have it laid out in Jess's video. But you can give them immediate relief now, Britt, you do this. I, I love these injections. I mean, one, you don't even need any medication to do this. Sure, you can use lidocaine, you can inject bupivacaine, but you can just dry needle and not inject anything, really. And the patient is going to tell you exactly where to do this. They are going to say, oh my gosh, right here, this spot, that is my tender, tender point. And you just inject right into there. And it's not, again, you can use lidocaine and bupivacaine, but a dry needle, it's really just breaking up that myofascial area and causing that release and tension. And people can get pretty instant relief from that. That's absolutely right. It really is that mechanics of going through that top band that's there. The lidocaine or bupivacaine is usually for a little bit improves maybe that post uh, injection, sure. not really to cause any uh, pain relief. Okay. So you talk about like, what can we do now? But what are some other things that we can recommend that the patient try at home? Even just easy over the counter stuff. So now we're going into our old time machine. So many people <laughs> might time. know, but if you don't, I was a pharmacist before I was a physician. And I remember this very clearly learning this when I was first in pharmacy school called a rubifacient. And maybe some people have heard of rubifacients, but rubifacients Sounds is like real old time pharmacy. 
<laughs> and that is, uh, we call them counter irritants. And here we have Bengay, so that's methyl salicylate. Our own Scott Kobner loves Tiger Balm, which is menthol. <laughs> so what they do is they irritate the skin that increases blood flow, and that is thought to provide pain relief. Now, the data does not support this well, but if everybody, we're going down our list yeah. here, and you know we're kind of running out of options a wee bit, right? So this is something I tell somebody, hey, try it. Now there's a lot of hardcore athletes, ex-athletes or weekend warriors who will swear by this. I just say, hey, if it works for you, it works for you. If not, you know, try there's it. There's no big downside, That's right? It's it. not dangerous. Absolutely. Okay, but going into things that are a downside and are a bit controversial let's say first of all we're going to put in a polling question so check that out in the chat we're going to put in a polling question about mm -hmm. steroids and that is one of the next things i want to ask you about what are your thoughts on muscle relaxants steroids opioids i mean we're getting desperate here these people are in so much pain oh my god doctor make the pain go away please give me something else yeah so this a is a magic pill <laughs> the magic <laughs> pill that does not exist folks you all know it does not exist right <laughs> uh this is the trifecta of do not prescribe so let's start with the latter two first corticosteroids opioids have no role in my opinion in these patients that we're talking about this acute or acute on chronic low back pain why is that corticosteroids sound great they're major anti-inflammatories mm -hmm. they do this and people will do bursts they'll do medrol dose packs they'll even might hey, do they a work local for injection COVID. they must work for yeah. everything right but not for back pain and that's All been right. shown in a number of studies and they have so many side effects even short burst starts, uh, uh, therapies of this so please no steroids and opioids this pain without getting too much into the chemical mediators is really don't get too nerdy don't do it. it's hard it's don't hard for me it. not to uh, <laughs> Prostaglandin mediated, opioids really are not the right drugs for that. And with all the things that we know about why we should not prescribe to opioids, they have not been shown. All the professional organization guidelines say do not use opioids. So let's get back to muscle relaxers because people are gonna say, all right, Sean, I'll, I'll give you the last two, but don't take my skeletal muscle relaxers away from me. <laughs> the reason is uh, this is a wastebasket class of pharmacologic agents. No one, including me, knows really how they work. So that tells you right away. Sean Nort doesn't well, know something. Well, that doesn't mean anything, no. but it just means, you know, <laughs> I spent a long time looking and saying, I can't figure these out. And what do they do? They really make you sleepy. Absolutely. And so the thinking is maybe by someone just getting sleepy, they just get up and they feel better. They have a lot of side effects. So again, would I never prescribe it? I mean, I will be honest with you, I have, but I spend a long time speaking with people and very, very infrequently will I prescribe a muscle relaxant. I really feel like they're just so sedating that temporarily you just forget about your back pain, shoot, you might even forget you have a back. And then it and then they wear off and it didn't really do anything to solve the pain. It gave you, sure, some momentary relief, but again, we didn't really address the issue and make long-term improvements. And hopefully a lot of the options that we've given uh, everyone listening will alleviate or even remove you know, uh, or at least temp temporize the pain that these people are experiencing. And yeah. you won't even have to consider this because we've given you, I think, a lot of good options. I think that's a great stepwise approach. I think that's super helpful. And just remember, this is no red flags, no that's fever. Right. You did a full neuro exam, all those things. This is just good old back pain. All right, thank you so much, Sean. I think this is really helpful for me and hopefully for everyone that's watching from home. Our next segment, I'm very excited about. It's our procedure of the month, and spoiler alert, it's gonna be neuro-related. Let's check it out. Greetings, welcome to the procedure of the month. This is actually going to be a little twist on that because we're going to talk about the neuro exam. And joining me for this segment is Paul Hanna, hey. who is a PA extraordinaire in Southern California. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you for having me. I would be remiss if I didn't also thank my nurse practitioner resident at the urgent care that I work at, Kiki Vance, who I saw this patient. We're gonna do a little bit of story time. Mm -hmm. And Paul is going to be placed 
figuratively speaking, in the role of the clinician, which was Kiki and myself seeing this patient. So this is what the information was we got. So you ready? Yeah. yeah. All right. Let's do On it. On your toes. Yeah. So this is a 37-year-old woman who came into our urgent care. And what we learned from the rooming note from our medical assistant was that she had had 24 hours of a headache mostly on the left side, mm -hmm. some vomiting and some vision, excuse me, vision changes. So past medical history, we looked through her chart. She had some uh, type two diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, her vitals that we got when she was checked in, pretty unremarkable other than her blood pressure being a, a bit, bit yeah. high. And then thankfully we had a proactive MA. So this was a vision complaint. Visual acuity was checked, the vital sign of the eye. And it was basically normal. It was 2030 in each eye individually and 2030 bilaterally. Okay. So Paul, since it's fast paced, urgent care, yeah. we're gonna have you make a decision about what to do with this patient, but I'm gonna give you only five questions for your only history. Five. So right. yeah, let's do ahead. this. Tell me what's the first question you wanna know. My, my first question would be, have, do you get headaches like that often? Uh, do you have history of migraines? Okay, great. So I will tell you that this was not a headache she'd had before, never had a headache with vomiting. All right, question number two. Walk me through what happened when you started having a headache. Uh, is it a th thunderclap headache? Is it something that was like flashing light? Great, so she, I'll tell you, it wasn't like a thunderclap. She said she was playing a video game and then all of a sudden, but not like a thunderclap, maybe over 15 minutes, the headache started and it's been there ever since, 24 okay. hours. Okay. Did she get hit in the head at all? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Some amazing how many people forget to mention that, maybe because they were hit in the head. Um, <laughs> but this woman um, and her husband attested to no recent trauma, and you could tell looking at her, there wasn't any evidence of trauma. Good, okay. Does she take any blood thinners? Oh, excellent question. You're already on a number four, and I love every one of them. So <laughs> no anticoagulation and no aspirin. Okay. All right, last question. Dive a little bit more deep into the visual complaint that she's having and maybe any other neurological symptoms that she has. Very good, yeah. And so vision complaints can be a lot of different things, flashers, floaters, which suggests a lot of different sort of differential than what she complained of, which was she's playing video games and then sort of gradually started having a harder and harder time seeing the uh, left side, the left side of her, uh, of her uh, television. So. That is the history we got. We got to move on though, because time's ticking. So I'll give you three things that you would like to do when you're examining her to yeah. make a decision about what to do next with this patient. What do you want to do? I usually start with the NIH score, kind of gives you a really good uh, detail, partially detailed yeah. exam where you can get how bad the, if it's a stroke, how bad it is. Great, all right. And it's called the stroke scale for a reason. So I will tell you that we did do an NIH stroke scale score and it, she actually scored zero, which is like, you know, it's perfect. Zero is a yeah. perfect score actually on that <laughs> exam. So. Besides the NIH stroke scale, what other things would you want to do? Uh, number two. I'd like to dive a little bit more deeper into her visual complaint. Uh, okay. I would check the eyes range of motion as well as her visual fields. Very good. So we did all those things and range of motion, um, extraocular movements, totally normal. And then visual fields, uh, you're going, hitting the nail on the head by asking that question. So I will say that we were able to ascertain that she had a area and it was on the, uh, right side, left side, I'm, I'm forgetting which side it was on now, but the other side of her headache, and it was a, the upper outer quadrant was seeming to be missing from her visual fields. Okay. So you got that piece of information now, and last exam maneuver. You always should check the heart and the lungs, listen to the heart and lungs for arrhythmias okay. or any uh, tachycardia or any, any of those findings. Good, yeah, so, so we were listening maybe for a, any a, evidence of AFib, strong murmurs. She had a regular rate, no strong murmurs. So moving on. You get to do maybe a couple of tests. We don't have a lot at our disposal. So anyway, you only get two to choose from. I, I usually would start with a glucose test just because she's a diabetic. Good. Make sure she's not hypo hypoglycemic. The other test I would do, get some urine, check for some ketones, any infection. Okay, good. So I'm thinking about DKA. The glucose, I'll tell you, uh, so she had negative ketones. The glucose was about 170. And since you checked the urine for a freebie, negative HCG. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So now we are at a decision point, and not only are you at a decision point, but you are at a decision point in the audience because we want to know what you would do based on this exam and history with this patient if she were sitting in front of you in urgent care. So the options for you, Paul, and audience are she could go home and see her primary care in a few days, obviously go to the ED if it's worse. Mm -hmm. Option two would be she could go to the ED now and have her husband drive her, or the third is the nuclear option, right? Sure. 911. So, <laughs> Among these answers, which would you choose for this patient if you had this information? You know, usually when I have a very high concern, I always offer a 911 call. Um, a lot of the times the patients don't want it and they push back for it. So talk them really into having the husband drive her to the ED. 
Got it. Okay. And yeah, I mean, if you're offering 911, then the ED by private vehicle sounds a little less aggressive. Yeah. Perhaps if for patients that come to urgent care, they usually don't want to go to the ED. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that we chose option. Well, actually, what did the audience choose? Let's. Uh... Okay. Well, it looks like B. So, and that is actually what we did in this case. And so the um, patient's husband was there. She had a vision complaint, so we didn't want her driving. But we were thinking, this may be a stroke, but with an NIH stroke scale of zero and being 24 hours out, this is not a stroke that we're going to be able to intervene upon. So she did drive to the ER, which is only about uh, two miles away. And in the ED, she had a head CT, and it showed this, which there's an area that looks a little abnormal, and I'm going to show you a little bit more specifically where that is. That is the occipital lobe. And for patients with visual field deficits, especially what this patient had, which is a uh, quadrant opia, homonymous quadrant opia, is that it localizes to the brain. And so we, we need neuroimaging. She actually went on to get an MRI of her brain confirming the stroke. And while she was admitted, had an echocardiogram and suffered from potentially this syndrome that uh, we mentioned in our, uh, in our trivia question. But she had a cardiomyopathy and an EF of 20%, which was really probably the reason for her stroke. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is what we're going to talk about now and the procedure we're going to demonstrate is, I don't know about you, what was it like for you doing your neuro rotation? What do they tell you about patients with headaches? Full neuro exam as right. usual. The full, the complete neuro exam. And uh, I worked and followed with neurologists and they did a neuro exam that had 75 components. They carried 20 tools. Some of them, they needed a separate bag for them. These are tools I don't have and this is not practical for urgent care. So what we're going to talk about is how do we do a screening neuro exam and then Based on that, anything that's abnormal, and then the patient's complaint, how do we do a complaint or more focused neuro exam? So maybe you can walk me through what is in your screening neuro exam for patients when they come in with a possible neuro complaint? Uh, I always will walk into the room looking at the patient, seeing how they're walking, how they're talking, how they're moving, um, any facial drooping or any vi visible findings that I can find. And then like you said, we'll dive a little deeper into the specific complaint that they're having. Great, so walking, talking, like you said, how are, how are they interacting with you? That's already orientation, that's coordination, that's gait. You're getting a lot of information from that. And then the complaint focused one could be something like we talked about low back pain. Well, maybe then you're doing a more focused exam mm -hmm. on the lower extremities, looking for weakness, looking for asymmetry of reflexes. That exam of asymmetric reflexes wouldn't have been a lot of help in this case. Mm -hmm. But what was helpful and what we're gonna talk about next is how do we assess visual fields? So if you all remember from your training, this is the vision system of our body. And we have obviously, hopefully two eyes and those signals come in through the optic nerves and cross at the chiasm where thereby everything from the right eye is projecting um, into our, every, all of the information about our right world is projecting to the left brain and vice versa for the left eye to the right brain. So for this patient, she had what, we, what was called a quadrinopia. So that's about where the lesion number five was, but because of the fact that it occurred in both eyes, regardless of which one was covered, I knew that it was a, what we call a cortical finding or in the brain. So Paul, we're gonna go through now how to do this exam and how I do it on patients. So first of all, I'm looking for major field cuts. So <laughs> pretend like you don't know what I'm gonna ask you to do. Okay. So start with looking straight in my eyes mm -hmm. and you look in the patient's eyes and say, keep looking right at my eyes or my nose. Mm -hmm. And then you're gonna start by saying, I'm gonna have you just keep looking here and point to which finger you see moving. Okay. And you're gonna stand about arm's width away and about eye level so that way your visual fields kind of match up. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, and here. Great. And the reason I do this instead of having people count fingers is if you're saying one or two, patients want to get the answers right. So they might actually guess right. And uh, that could happen 50% of the time. So I like finger movements better. Now we're going to dive into a more in-depth field exam for patients that are actually complaining of a visual field deficit. So for this one, you're going to have them alternately cover their eyes. So I'm going to have you cover either one of your eyes, whichever one you want to start with. And then you cover your eye to see kind of where the visual field should be. Mm -hmm. Keep that eye covered. And we're going to do the same thing again. Point to mm -hmm. which finger you see moving. Mm -hmm. For this one, you're going to cover the entire visual field. So start high. Good. And good. And when, when they point, you know they're seeing you move. Great, and do the same thing on the other side. Keep looking at my nose. <laughs> if they cheat, you can do it again. <laughs> 
It's human nature. Great. And so now I know that his visual fields are intact. But for this patient, what she did was find that she couldn't see with either eye covered this whole area. And we knew that was a cortical finding. Thanks, Paul. All right. So to wrap up uh, this case, I wanted to talk about what I learned because there were a lot of lessons. So the first was, we're going to do actually this with a little bit of myth, myth busting. So something that I <laughs> once believed to be the case uh, was that young patients don't get ischemic strokes. Well, turns out that's false. Actually, about 15% of cases of ischemic stroke in this country occur in patients under 45 years of age. And that number is actually increasing and it's gone up by about 50% in the last 30 years. All right, myth number two, a normal NIH stroke scale rules out the possibility of an acute ischemic stroke. Well, it certainly makes it less likely, but it does not rule it out. As was the case with this patient, she truly had a NIS of zero, both in the urgent care and in the emergency department. And what we find is that with posterior strokes, they can be missed with these NIH stroke scales. So do not rely on this to definitively rule out an ischemic stroke. And the final myth is that I learned this uh, in residency and I've thought this for a long time, is that ischemic strokes don't cause headaches. Well, turns out I was wrong. This is actually not an uncommon finding. About 20% of patients with acute ischemic stroke will have a headache, as was the case with this patient. And very fittingly, this patient had all of the criteria for people at risk for having headaches associated with their ischemic stroke, posterior strokes, younger patients, and women. So this case was really illustrative and hopefully will be helpful for you in doing a less thorough, complete neuro exam and a more focused one based on your patient's complaints. And now we are going to go to Dr. Kobner for What's the Evidence? Yeah. Girls into doctor right away. for everyone's favorite topic in all of urgent care medicine, gastritis. I love gastritis. You see it all the time. You can actually help these people, and it's an area we can really develop our own expertise. There's a whole bunch of medications that you've probably given to patients that suffer from some form of dyspepsia. And this is how I feel when I look over this list. I feel like I'm floating in a sea of trash. Uh, most of the stuff that we do, it's garbage. We just prescribe it because somebody told us to, because somebody else prescribed the thing we were gonna choose, so we need to try something different. We wanna stand out. I don't know, most of it's garbage. And we're gonna talk about the evidence behind the stuff that actually works, so you get less bounce backs, you get happier patients, and overall, you're a better clinician. So let's jump into it right now. I like to use a very simple framework. How do we generally approach dyspepsia? We just throw some stuff against the wall. We don't do that in any other part of medicine, really. We have great algorithms, great way of thinking through the problem. I like to steal a framework from something we're all very comfortable treating in the urgent care in any clinical setting realistically, and that is asthma. So we're gonna drop out the uh, albuterol inhaler. We're gonna substitute some good, good antacids. Let's get started. When we treat asthma exacerbations, we think of an acute treatment, and then we also think of a controller treatment that we're gonna send patients out on. So we should think about dyspepsia, or gastritis, in the same exact way. So when we're talking about acute medications, that's what we're gonna deal with in this visit for this patient. How can we get those symptoms maximally under control in the short time we're spending with them so we can all high five all around before we give them their discharge instructions. Now, if you've worked in any clinical environment, you've seen the only thing in the urgent care, in the hospital, wherever, that you can order by typing into your EMR as a cocktail, the classic GI cocktail. You've probably worked even in the same hospital system, urgent care system, and what's in the cocktail is different from site to site. It depends who the bartender pharmacist is that day. And I can tell you right now, there's great literature on what's in the cocktail, and 95% of it is total crap. We're giving people Benadryl, we're giving viscous lidocaine, we're giving some stuff that you found under the couch. It's all shaked up and you ask the patient to drink it. All of the meta-analyses, the randomized controlled trials show one thing. 99% of these types of cocktails with combined agents don't work as well as a simple treatment that actually has evidence behind it. And that is just prescribing or administering 
an antacid. It's as simple as that. So I, I don't always prescribe a cocktail, but when I do, the only thing that's in it is an antacid. Which one that you use, you know, there are some comparative studies. It doesn't matter. The one in your EMR, it's gonna be like aluminum hydroxide, some crazy chemical name, you can use your brand name thing. But the important thing to know is that's the fastest thing to resolve acute symptoms in the short-term setting. It's gonna taste better for your patients, they're gonna get the relief they need, and it's super simple to order. And also, they know exactly what to get at the pharmacy on an outpatient basis if they wanna pick something up for, you know, some PRN symptom relief. But now, when we treat asthma, we don't just shove albuterol on someone's face and then kick them out the door. We provide them with something a little bit extra to prevent that bounce back, to give them a little bit longer coverage to prevent another flare from occurring. And the main thing we have to think about here is how we can help these dyspeptic patients once the antacid is gone. And there's a bunch of different biochemical targets we can choose from to reduce the protons production in the stomach. But there's one that matters more than any else in this setting, and it's because of this. We care about time to relief of symptoms. We're providing an acute therapy, and we want something that's gonna trail off and linger around a little bit longer for folks after they leave your urgent care. So they think, man, wasn't that the greatest doctor, the greatest PA I've ever seen in my entire life? I feel great seven hours later before I snack down on some more flaming Hot Cheetos. What we're gonna target here is the histamine II receptor antagonist therapy. And the reason why is the evidence shows pretty conclusively that this has an equal onset of action time to those antacids, which are directly opposing the acid of the stomach, but they last a lot longer. You can get four to six hours of additional benefit, additional relief that just isn't seen with that short-term antacid treatment. So it's the perfect analogy here with the steroids lasting just a little bit longer in asthma, giving that histamine II receptor antagonist, your famotidine is a great thing to set your patients up for success once they leave your clinical area. So this is my cocktail for everybody that comes in that's complaining of dyspepsia. So I'm verified that is dyspepsia. We're not gonna get into like red flags, you know, the MI that you're missing because they've got a little bit of burning pain. These are for people who feel very comfortable that this is just true dyspepsia from gastritis. This is what they're getting. But what about the patient that it's the worst episode they've ever had in their life? You've all had that patient. The constant pain, they've tried this stuff acutely, it doesn't seem to work, they're super symptomatic, you know it's not an MI, you know it's nothing else. They want to have something that can get their symptoms under control before they walk out. Where are we going from here? In the asthma analogy, this is the person that's getting the epinephrine, right? There's, this is the critical care of dyspepsia treatment. And we're gonna add a surprising twist here, an anti-emetic, but not just any old anti-emetic. It's the long forgotten hero of the clinical care environment. The one, the only, the antipsychotic. Haloperidol, great example, literature supporting it. A hero, once again, to come save the day in these patients. There's a whole body of literature actually called neuroleptal analgesia. It's evolving over the last 10 years. You might've heard of some other studies in some other settings, such as like cyclic vomiting syndromes. Um, there seems to be a real link between what's going on neuropsychiatrically with us and the true brains of our body, the gut and the biome and the dopamine receptors that are shared between these two organ systems. Now, I know this is called What's the Evidence? There's no RCT, there's no meta-analysis looking at the administration of these antipsychotics in the setting of just plain old dyspepsia. But in the palliative care literature, the other cyclical vomiting literature, the dysmotility literature, there's a large like trend that we just can't ignore, that these medications help these patients with analgesia. And so why not, in a relatively low-risk environment, have this on your tool belt to offer to these folks that are just suffering without relief and so you can get them feeling better before they leave your clinic, your urgent care environment. So this is my overall acute care cocktail for these people, but what are we gonna do once they're out the door? We're going over to the controller medications. This is the area of the most controversy. This is the area where you just pick something off that board I said before, try something that someone else hasn't done, and it leads to disaster for the patient. If you look up really complicated algorithms from like the you know American Gastroenterological Society, um, we can just ignore 90% of this because it's like try one tablet every five minutes, lick it, put it back in the bottle. This is like a outpatient treatment of something. It's gonna take 25 years. They're coming to the urgent care. This is an urgent problem. They're suffering. We're gonna just skip some steps and cut to the part that matters. These are people who are having exacerbation. Let's give them the medicine they need. Unequivocally, the medicine to provide these folks is a PPI for four weeks. Why four weeks, you might ask. You might read in other places that you should try a two-week trial. 
Well, four weeks is the maximum amount of time that we allow this therapy to work before upgrading the patient to endoscopy. So if you're asking this person to follow up with a PMD, the first move of that provider is gonna say, have you tried this for four weeks? And it feels really bad to be a patient and have only received half of the treatment and you have to come back in two more weeks and then get upgraded to another, another level of care. So give them the four week trial. It's not going to hurt them and it will probably solve their problem. This has also been shown when we compare it against other therapies, namely histamine 2 receptor antagonists, the famotidine, to be more efficacious. And there's some really interesting pharmacological reasons why this is the case. Something that you probably never learned before, I was ashamed that I didn't hear about this before, is that histamine 2 receptor antagonists have a huge tachyphylaxis response. What does that mean? The more you take it, the less effective it is. After about five days, the efficacy of medications like famotidine, when they're used continuously for those five days, drops down to about 30%. I'm sure you, just like me, have prescribed somebody 30 days of famotidine before. And so now I know for five of those days, I did something to actually help the patients. For 25 other days, it probably wasn't having the effect I had intended. So that's why we're reaching for the PPI in this circumstance. Otherwise, what are you doing on your next shift? You're going to see this patient again. It's so important to get this medication right. Let's talk about the elephant in the room lifestyle modifications. What's the evidence behind that? All the reasons we can think of why people might have dyspepsia, the food they eat, the fact that, you know, they're still in 2024 trying to put off those COVID pounds, those 50 pounds. I'm working on it myself. It's crazy. What's the evidence behind these lifestyle modifications? Not great, not great at all. And think about it realistically. If you had an RCT that you asked a bunch of people to lose weight and exercise, and the other group, you asked them to continue what's gonna go on with their life, you're gonna have a lot of crossover happening because lifestyle modifications are really hard to do. But the ones that have borne out the most in the literature are two things, losing weight, which is challenging, but one that's really easy, elevating the head of the bed. Patients get immediate symptomatic relief if their dyspepsia is being triggered by esophageal reflux. Just putting an extra pillow or two under their head at night can really help them the morning after. So all those heart failure patients that you saved with diuresis, just take their pillows that they were sleeping on and pass them off to your dyspeptic patients. Boom, bada bing, bada boom, two for one deal, guys. How can you not love that? Dietary modifications are huge. We've all seen the epidemic of flaming hot Cheetos. That's something that people can actually enact in their daily life. And especially with like younger kids, you have the parent, it's like, I don't know why their belly hurts so much. And every trip to 7-Eleven involves something really spicy, really hot. Tell them if they don't wanna have a follow-up trip to the urgent care after the 7-Eleven trip, might be cutting down on these would be a good tip. Don't need an RCT for this to make this decision in my opinion. Nevertheless, 54% of patients in some studies, the few big studies about PPI and outpatient therapy, end up coming back to an emergent or acute care setting for dyspepsia because they've had a treatment failure. And the number one reason that this occurs is not because PPIs don't work, it's because this is an actual screenshot of the discharge instructions you gave this patient who might have a language barrier or you thought, ah, this is like a rule out case. So, uh, you know, they just have gastritis. I'm just going to like kind of ghost discharge them and not really sit down and explain how this medication works. And you can't blame the patients. This is the candy score of gumdrops and lollipops that they've been prescribed over the dyspepsia journey for the last five years. Pepsid, am I supposed to take it when I just have symptoms? Um, I'm not sure. Omeprazole, am I supposed to take it every day? What about the Tums? They're very confused and we do a poor job of explaining it. So if there's one intervention for controlling their symptoms you can provide, it's this simple talk. You're gonna say, I'm gonna give you this medication for four weeks. It's really important that you take it an hour before you eat breakfast because it needs some time to work. And you're gonna take it every single day, regardless of whether or not you have symptoms for the next four weeks. I want you to take it to give yourself a chance to heal. And then after that, this is what you're gonna look like. You're gonna be so happy. Your symptoms are gonna be gone in the majority of cases. Obviously, you wanna get these people to some important follow-up if they continue to have symptoms, but that's for an evidence for another talk. You can always refer them to the P their PMD, and if there's any alarm symptoms, immediately consider getting them a GI consult or sending them to a higher level of care, but you guys are super smart. You know how to do that stuff already. Just to review, everything in white, there's good evidence for. Everything in red, for your first line treatment, there's really not great evidence for your run-of-the-mill non, uh, non-specific dyspepsia. So stick to these four things, especially the PPI for four weeks and your patients are gonna love you for it. That's all I've got for What's the Evidence. We have a great segment coming up next. We're gonna be talking about some bounce backs. What was that? Hold on, this. Whoa. 
This is where it's supposed to be. All right, let's move on to the case. So, um, you guys, this case is really interesting and already going to start terrifying because it is an 18-month-old. So, I'm going to present this case to you. It's an 18-month-old. They're coming in with one to two days of fever, vomiting, and per the nursing note who was providing some, you know, chief complaint history for you, the parents say that the kid is lethargic. Mm. <laughs> Paul, I'm going to direct the first question to you. What other history do you want from family about this kiddo? Um, I would ask about their vaccine status, recent travel, sick exposures are kind okay. of my first go-to questions for a kid with these symptoms. No one else is sick. I mean, the kid's in daycare, so yeah, right. But mm -hmm. no one that they know of that's a close contact that's been sick. No recent travel. I also am going to give you guys some vital signs. Blood pressure 73 over 53. Heart rate is 123. Respiratory rate's 43. Temp 100.6, satting 100% on room air. Paul, any other questions or group? Any other questions you want to ask family about what's been going on? Yeah, would you like me to call 911 or do you guys want to do it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I know it's a kid. No one freak out. They're 18 months. I know it's scary, but... I want to know feeding. I want to know wet diapers. I want to know, like, what does lethargy, lethargy really mean, right? I mean, is this a kid that is not tracking? Is this kid that's kind of out of it? Or is this a kid that's just more frequent naps and those kind of things but still making wet diapers and... Sure. Um, they are eating and drinking, a little bit of decreased appetite, but they're still having a good number of wet diapers, normal bowel movements. Um, and uh, they're kind of vague in like this lethargy. They don't know the word lethargy. That was just what's mm. documented uh, by your nursing staff. Um, but they're just saying he's kind of a little, a little off. Uh, I would like to, to ask Scott about these vital signs. What do you think? Yeah, you know, it's always concerning when you have somebody, a kid at this age that's coming with fever and this idea of lethargy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm at least assured that the blood pressure for an 18-month-old, I'm surprised that we got one. Uh, you got we, one. We've got a cuff that yeah. fits. They've got a blood pressure. <laughs> That's um, why it's not so bad. It's because it's the wrong cuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> it's a little um, soft for yeah, an 18-month-old. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's a little soft, but again, like, I don't know if I ever get a reliably great blood totally. pressure on an 18-month-old. They're moving, they're squirming, they're flexing, the cuff doesn't fit, so yeah. that's what we got. Perfect. And then the other thing I want to know, I mean, the heart rate for an 18 month old at 123, when that was actually taken, is this kid like sitting there calmly? Are they crying or they're screaming? Like, how does that line up with the actual kid's presentation at this moment? Probably about as good as you're going to get. They're just kind of squirming around. They're not hysterically crying. You haven't walked in the room yet. Because <laughs> cool. okay. you always walk in the room, but they freak out when they see the doctor come in. But the kid's just kind of sitting there acting his normal self without blood. That's the Perfect. resting heart rate. Yeah, especially if the kid's not freaking out. I'm, I'm a little bit concerned, especially the respiratory rate of being 43. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. This is not a normal set of vital signs for a kid that's not the, the screaming greeting I normally get when mm -hmm. someone sees this mug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Josh, next question for you. In terms of physical exam, and just like a neuro exam, we're going to do a complete physical exam. Is there anything in particular you want to know about this kid? Well, yeah, I mean, it's a small enough child, you're gonna undress them fully. Like sure. that's super important. So like, important. Point number one, especially during the winter time, I don't yeah. care how much they're bundled up. Um, I also wanna know this temperature, was it checked by just waving the magic wand across their forehead? That's a rectal temp. Okay, good. Um, so I'm gonna first just look at the child and see if they're behaving normally. Like I'm looking for anything that's yeah. reassuring in that. Uh, this is a bounce back case, so I can only go off of what was documented, but they document that the kid is generally well appearing non-toxic, doesn't look acutely ill. Um, in terms of this lethargy, um, a normal neuro exam is documented mm -hmm. and nothing that seems like they're particularly sleepy or drowsy or just they're, they're interacting with you normally. Okay. I mean, obviously I'm gonna check everything on the skin, looking for a rash. I would love, and that neuro exam, there's a lot of things that were mentioned, but it doesn't really paint a picture, right? Mm -hmm. So like, Tell me, is a kid playing with mom's cell phone? Is he, you know, 
playing with my stethoscope when I'm doing it, or is he just sort of lying there? And then how yeah. much is he moving his head? I'm thinking about meningitis in this case a little bit, and like I want to see the kid tracking me with more than just eye movements. Tracking, normal tone, um, interacting with you, playing with your stethoscope. Uh, again, I'm going off of what was documented. And uh, pupils are equal and reactive. You don't appreciate anything focal. Okay. And then there was vomiting, so I'm going to examine the abdomen, also looking just the ears, some other source yeah. of, for, for the fever, the common sources for fever in this age range. Totally. Um, ears, nose, throat, totally clear. No signs of a pharyngeal infection, no, no signs of otitis media. Um, abdomen is soft, non-tender, and for all intents and purposes, this is a normal exam. Everything documented is normal. The only thing probably abnormal that you're seeing on this kid at this point is the vital signs aren't perfect. One other question I like to ask, especially if a parent says, you know, they're not acting normally, mm -hmm. like I definitely don't have memorized all of those like two blocks at two or whatever, you know, like mm -hmm. all those milestones, but some questions to explore what that abnormal behavior is to that parent. Like mm -hmm. it, sometimes it could be as simple as they're eating differently, which may mm -hmm. give you clues to some weakness of the bulbar muscles to some actual regression that right. could be occurring that gives you a little bit more of a clue. I know this is a bounce back case because yeah. if that person didn't ask that question, you might not have it. But And what is described in the documentation is that, you know, I see that word lethargy as like a very strong mm -hmm. word to say and that like piques all of our interest because that is a that to me lethargy is a sick kid right mm -hmm. um, but what is documented is that the kid is interactive he's playful I think the only thing that was abnormal to the parents is he's maybe not as active as his normal bouncing off the wall self mm -hmm. and he's eating a little less but he's still tolerating PO except for that one to two times that he vomited um, and having normal bowel movements and wet diapers. Sean, my next question is, what's your differential for this kid? Well, I mean, common things being most common, and again, I mean, I know you said it is, but like, good cop refill, he can walk, like yep. you can walk the kid, he doesn't stop eating because he like gets exhausted or anything. So I'm assuming that that's all the case. So common things presenting most commonly, you're going to think of a viral, you know, uh, any diarrhea? No diarrhea. So at least an enteritis. So to remember, you gotta have to have gastroenteritis, you gotta have the enteritis bit. So be careful with just vomiting only, lending to like a surgical things. But you always wanna start with, you know, worst first, mm -hmm. right? So I'm going to be thinking meningitis. I'm going to listen to his lungs, see, you know, his sats are okay, mm -hmm. right? So it makes probably respiratory less likely. Is this we didn't get a birth history, at least that I remember. Normal birth history, per perfect. fully so, vaccinated, vaginal, full-term delivery. Excellent. So we're not worried like ex or RSV, mm -hmm. you know, COVID, all this other kind of maybe with a complication of an ex -premie. So uh, the money is going to be probably, if it's not viral, urine, right? You're going to start with kind of some low-hanging fruit. Uh, I'd cap this kid. And for me, I'm going to establish access and I'm going to probably give this kid a bolus if I really believe this, you know, uh, blood pressure you know if I, I would recycle this blood pressure and i would i don't know where i am on the curve okay. and i don't want to be painted in a corner that's fair and it's uh, the other thing that i was just thinking about when we were going through your differential is you know if the rest of the exam is normal we've got clear lungs and this kid is a little bit on the tachypnic side is not hypoxic mm. we know that there's vomiting going on is there something else metabolic also mm, happening absolutely. it doesn't explain the fever component but this could be a much sicker child than sure. we're at least initially hearing from the story and how the kid looks. If they're trying to keep up with something, there isn't a primary respiratory driver of what's happening here. So um, you can go ahead and start a line. You give them a bolus. Um, you give them some Tylenol, some Motrin for the little bit of the fever. Uh, kid still is looking pretty good. Um, you give him some graham crackers. He tolerates PO. And uh, at this point, with all the information, that's all the information I've got for you. What's your dispo? And the vital signs are the same? Oh, or? repeat vital signs. Let me repeat those for you. Oh. Um, repeat uh, vital signs. You got a blood pressure of 88 over 50, heart rate of 118, respiratory rate 24, and the temperature has gone down to 99. What's the time period been? Uh, we will say he's been there for about an hour. I, for me, you know, and I just don't see kids as often as I used to, an hour is not enough for me for this kid. Like, you can never trade time. Right, and we're talking ED, right? This is a kid who was. We're in the urgent care. So you're still in, ur we're in okay, urgent care. Okay, so you're care. in urgent care. <laughs> I would probably, even if I'm in urgent care, and I do work in urgent care, uh, uh, I, I would give myself another hour. But okay. if things looked otherwise, you know, the same, and he looks great, and he's eating and not vomiting, 
I think it would be hard not to discharge him as long as, you know, good pediatrician follow-up and good return precautions and all those things like that. Okay. Paul, what are your return precautions for this kid? Because I'm going to tell you in another hour... He looks the exact same. Yeah. He looks great. He's the vital signs are the same. He's still tolerating PO. Mom, dad are like, all right. Well, um, he's not vomiting anymore. So can we go home? Yep. Um, I, I think I agree. I would send him home um, after a couple hours of monitoring him. Um, return precautions for me would be um, if he's not tolerating PO, if his fever is persisting and you're not able to control it. Obviously, if he's acting abnormal and kind of diving a little bit more into that lethargy that mm -hmm. they were talking about. And I was explaining to him what lethargy looks like, would look like, and this is when you would take him to the ED. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I think uh, I would do the exact same thing. I think probably all of us would do the exact same thing. It's time for this guy to go home. Strict return precautions, close follow-up, you do that. Of course, I led with this as a bounce back case, so everyone's like on the edge of their seat mm -hmm. waiting to see what <laughs> happens. So the bounce back. So the kid and the family do exactly what they're supposed to do. They have a close follow-up appointment with their pediatrician literally the next day. We're talking like 15 hours later. Mm -hmm. And the pediatrician sees this kid and is like, ruh -ruh. Uh, The kid is now drowsy. Mm -hmm. He's sleepy. He's arousable. He'll perk up and start interacting with you, but he's kind of nodding off and just not being a normal 18-month-old. Mm -hmm. He has now um, got these vital signs. His mm -hmm. blood pressure, again, is a bit soft for an 18-month-old, 78 over 40. Heart rate resting, nearly sleeping in mom's arms is 150, mm -hmm. so pretty tachycardic. The respiratory rate is up again at 44, still afebrile at this point. And this is a sinus rhythm, I'm assuming? Great question. Mm -hmm. So the pediatrician uh, is like, Gotta go. 911, we're going straight across to the ER. The kid gets to the ER. At this point, they're in triage and they are unable to get a blood pressure. The kid's still nodding off and drowsy. He starts to have a seizure. He is rushed back to the emergency room. They uh, establish a line. They start to give him some Ativan for the seizure and he loses pulses. They intubate the child, they do CPR, they run the code like they would any pediatric code. Unfortunately, after about an hour of trying to resuscitate mm -hmm. this kid, he, uh, they pronounce him dead. He did not survive. At what point did anyone check the glucose? They the did. Glucose? Oh, okay. Great question. Yeah. And the glucose was 100. Okay. Yeah, great question. Um, what do you think the diagnosis is? I mean, hearing about this case the first time, whoever actually had this on any side, it's like yeah. heartbreaking. Uh, what a horrific case to, to just have um, as a provider. So, I mean, I just want to say on there, thanks for whoever shared this because uh, mm -hmm. it's like super challenging. I don't know. I mean, for me, like, yes, the retrospective scope is great because we can look back and I'll say, ah, well, this vital sign on the screen a little bit <laughs> yeah, normal. Right. But um, the thing that I just keep going back to is like, even though we saw an improvement in vital signs on that first visit, like... Going from a respiratory rate in the 40s to still in like the high 20s, um, there is something still going on in that child. Mm -hmm. And whether That's it's a fair point, yeah, yeah, like metabolic in origin, if there is, I know that we're febrile, if there's an infectious process going on at some point, uh, whether it's CNS or not, it's weird to have those like kind of flares. And I, did they actually get in between those vital signs any of those therapies, like the, the fluid that Sean talked about or? Yeah, they got in they the got urgent the, care. Okay. They got fluids. Um, they got the antipyretic. They they did check a urine. There were no ketones. Mm. There was no infection. It was normal. Yeah, mm. I mean you have to be thinking like CNS infection totally, at this point. Yeah. Just for com well, I say common things being common. It's like yeah. super rare, but like in this <laughs> setting, we know all the yeah. all the things that happen. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think seizures, it's but I think it's probably fair to say that after presenting all of this information. I felt clueless on what the diagnosis yeah. is. And I think probably you guys would agree, like there's no way to know what the diagnosis mm -hmm. is. Yeah, and I, I just don't, just to round it out, I don't think this is an inborn error <laughs> of metabolism. It's kind of, it was a late present, you know, yeah. and yeah. you would expect them to not resolve with the therapies because this comes up in toxicology quite a bit for kids and way it turns out, but they're early on, right? Could something weird toxin, and it can be a delayed, and sometimes when they're stressed, right, it, it, it will exacerbate, you know, not the ones that are put in the kind of the perinatal period or at least in the neonatal period. So I, I agree with Scott or, so, you know, like, I don't think this is going to be, you know, so out there like, uh, 
inborn error of metabolism yeah. or some kind of other weird, weird thing, even though it, it it's, I'm sure, weird. Yeah. It, it is not normal, <laughs> and I'm just going to cut straight to it. This was a postmortem diagnosis of acute viral myocarditis. Mm. Acute viral myocarditis would not even be something, honestly, on my differential. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you guys feel about that. I think looking into this diagnosis, because it's just not even one that I've made in a kid, maybe even, I think one time I saw like myocarditis or uh, pericarditis after the COVID vaccine, but myocarditis and viral in a kid, they can present almost completely asymptomatic. And under 10 years of age, they're not gonna, they very unlikely are going to have chest pain, nor would they be able to really oh, yeah. tell you that they have chest pain. The tachycardia is one of the things that is might be that giveaway, but I mean, a fever can make you tachycardic. Mm -hmm. A fever and just a kid that doesn't want to be at the doctor's office can make them tachypnic. Mm -hmm. It's like, a really hard diagnosis to yeah. make, and I think anyone would have discharged this kid from urgent care. I certainly would have, and I wouldn't have made this diagnosis, to be completely honest. Yeah, that's like absolutely heartbreaking, um, especially for someone that's having like, because the hard thing about like myocarditis, you can have that respiratory manifestation without actually having the like soaked lungs. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't really talk too much about the change in fever and the heart rate, but there's like a very narrow list of things actually um, that you can remain with a lower heart rate and elevated fever. That's sure. the yeah. Fajot yeah. sign. Right. Um, and even though they went from 123 to 118 on that initial visit when they have like 106 to 99 or whatever yeah. it was the resolution. Um, it's easy to say in the background that like, hey, that didn't actually resolve as much as we did mm -hmm. in a, a patient that's like looking great and cheerful. That's just like a really tough. It's thing a to super say. tough diagnosis, and yeah. I think you know it wasn't really until you get that resting heart rate of 150 in an afebrile yeah. kid who's just like sleeping there, like now truly lethargic, mm -hmm. where you're like oh, no, this is not a nothing burg. This is something very serious with this kid. Um, and I think a lot of us would go to a CNS infection, especially with the lethargy, the vomiting. And it's just like one, I think, important point to make about this kid is that, one, it's, the, it's normal to miss this, right? Like any one of us would have missed this diagnosis. At least I, I would have. Okay. Um, and I think that the strict return precautions and really good follow-up mm -hmm. for this kid is really the best thing you can do from the urgent care. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. this was just a really devastating mm -hmm. outcome. And to Scott's point, the tachycardia more than you expect with the fever is just give this diagnosis a thought. And even here sitting here in the calmness of uh, discussing it way after the patient's gone and there's no other patients, that still didn't get our hackles up enough. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it's a good reminder that that out of proportion tachycardia mm -hmm. is, is concerning. Yeah. I think another good take home point too for folks, um, you like work in a place that has point of care troponin, which is like magical, right? Mm -hmm. um, to just know that there is some literature, especially in pediatric myocarditis, mm -hmm. that um, troponins might not actually be the most sensitive assay. Right. And like actually your AST could actually be a little bit more sensitive uh, in these cases. And they can rapidly decompensate to the point where you would have missed your window to see that. You can have all different degrees of like perimyo and full on myocarditis that have different like biochemical signatures. And the timing isn't as great as looking for just ACS. So you could be falsely reassured, even if you got a point of care trope mm -hmm. in an 18 month old, which like right. who would order uh, that? You and know, also, like, I mean, you asked about like uh, if the if the EKG was sinus tachycardia. I mean, I don't know if I've ever ordered an EKG on an 18 month old, to be completely honest with you. With a heart rate of 150, it's like, I'm not looking for SVT. That's not too high for us. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. thinking that. Um, but one, the EKG in this kid could have been completely normal. Maybe you'd see some sinus tachycardia. Some changes that you can see on EKG with a myocarditis, you could see some T wave inversion. You could see some, uh, basically some small QRS complexes maybe some ST elevation, but honestly, the most common thing would just be some sinus tachycardia, which is, again, really non-specific. Plus you're looking at a juvenile. And equation. you're looking at it, yeah, <laughs> which you can have T-wave inversion right, in exactly. V1, no. 2, and 3. Mm -hmm. That is not abnormal. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap up from this case. Thank you guys for playing along. They did not know what this case was, so they're very brave. Um, I want to make a shout out to Sa Shane Soldier. He uh, got the answer. What was the answer to our trivia question? Go for it. It was uh, Takotsubo's myocard uh, uh, cardiomyopathy, and that also was the diagnosis of the case that I presented with Paul. So it seemed really appropriate. And Valentine's Day is just around the corner, so 
Don't forget about that either. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Um, there were a couple questions that came up. People really liked the back pain. Yes. And for our pharmacists, one of the things that came up, is there any difference in renal effects from different PO NSAIDs? Are all the NSAIDs created equal for the kidney or one better than the other? So uh, they do have different effects. And so uh, we are actually going to be doing an MRAP piece with one of our pharmacists of uh, Corpendium. That, so stay tuned if you're an MRAP subscriber, we're gonna do an audio on this. But there are, and just so Ketorolac generally does have more th adverse effects, including stronger effects on the kidneys. But uh, for the short courses you're using in the otherwise healthy person, three to five days, I really wouldn't worry too much if it's somebody who's particularly healthy. Awesome. There was one more question. People really like those trigger point injections. So I highly encourage you to check out Jess's video. It's really, really helpful. Um, but we talked about lidocaine. We talked about bupivacaine. We talked about dry needle. Anyone ever tried just sterile saline? You can't. Oh, oh yeah. Scott's yeah. laughing. What's up? I haven't. I'm. I'm. A, I want the RCT. That's just dry needling versus me poking you really hard in the back with my <laughs> finger. Because it's like we started with bupivacaine. We moved to like I know there is the sterile water studies which work, and then the dry needling ones also show benefits. Yeah. So I'm just. A, I'm just a naysayer, you know, like Sean, you yeah, no, well, probably should I'll answer. tell you, because I actually have kind of looked at this a wee bit. Uh, if you look at the people who do this that are not physicians, PAs, nurse practitioners, chiropractors, acupuncturists, and they, particularly the acupuncturists, only dry needle. And speaking to a fair number of PMR uh, clinicians, that's where dry needling is the way, the way to go. I know about the saline stuff I'm going to see, but uh, so I would say dry needling is as good as the local anesthetics. To be honest, I do usually do a little Lido, but I do it right at the end. I don't do it like, I don't load them up with like three mils of lidocaine. But uh, are these great studies? No, but I mean, I know that they have looked at this and said, yeah, it is as good. That makes less sense to me you know, uh, why that would work compared to just the dry needling, because the whole thought is that there is, without getting too much into it, but that's a tight right. band, <laughs> and it's thought that there's like lactic acid buildup, that's some of the pain, and by doing that, you release that band, and then they reperfuse and clear out all that lactic acid, as, amongst other things. So I think, long story short, if mm -hmm. you really want to use sterile saline, go for it, yeah. but dry needling, probably just as effective. But we will get that randomized control trial for you going, the Scott. Pope study. The Pope <laughs> study. <laughs> all right. Here. All right, thank you guys all for joining us. Thank you, faculty. Uh, just as a reminder, our next Grand Rounds is March 6th, March 6th, and that's going to be emergency medicine. So we'll see you then.